Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I am your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. Today, we are journeying back to a pivotal year in Henry's reign, 1513. Picture it. The kingdom is a formidable power, a titan of the late Middle Ages. It's ruled by a young and ambitious and charismatic monarch, Henry VIII, who is yet to be the infamous figure we often associate with six marriages and the English Reformation. But before we get started, your reminder about TudorCon. Okay, so if you can't make it in person to Pennsylvania this year, September 8th through 10th, we have the online tickets available. So you want to go to englandcast.com slash TudorCon online to find out all about that, to get your ticket, to reserve your spot. Use code EARLYBIRD to save $10 off of your ticket. And I would suggest that you do it early because we have limits. We have space as to how much we can do. I know it's like the internet and it's like things are unlimited. And in theory, they are. But there's also just so much that we can keep up with in terms of like questions that come in and serving people. And, you know, I don't want it to just be like this massive amount of people that we can't interact with easily and everything like that. So we have some limits as to how much space there is. And it's a really good deal. So it's $49 without the coupon code. You come live to all of the talks. They'll all be recorded. So you'll get the recordings. Um, You'll also get the transcripts. Like super good deal. You're also going to get a digital goodie bag with some free ebooks and all kinds of good stuff. So englandcast.com slash TudorCon online to learn more and reserve your spot. Somebody asked me the other day how long the recordings will be available. And I said like kind of forever um, because I'm basically just going to send out a Dropbox link that has all of the recordings in. So as long as Dropbox stays in business, which I think will be for quite some time, those links will be there. So you can watch at your leisure. If the time zone doesn't work for you because you're in Australia or something like that, you can you know watch when you're able. They're part of this online community of other TutorCon attendees. It's going to be so much fun. I hope you can make it online, englandcast.com slash TutorCon online to learn more. Okay. So this is prompted, and I'm going to probably do a couple of similar episodes to this because I've been reading Alison Weir's new book, um, The King's Pleasure. You know, she did that series on the six wives, and we had her on the show a couple of times talking about her various, uh, the various wives as that series was coming out. And it was historical fiction, and every book, you know, kind of focused on a different wife. So now she's doing it from Henry's perspective. So the book is The King's Pleasure. And it basically is, you know, historical fiction from Henry's perspective of Henry's life. And so it's gotten me thinking about things that I haven't thought about yet, because, you know, as much as I say I'm all in favor of empathy and seeing other sides and everything like that, I don't often think about things from Henry's perspective. Uh, That might be a failing on my part. So anyway, reading this book has gotten me thinking about things from Henry's perspective. Because, you know, like nobody thinks they're the villain. Nobody in life. This is like a life pro tip. right? You have to remember in life that even the villains don't think they're the villains. And so Henry never saw himself as a villain. He often just saw himself as being wronged. Um, So, yeah, it's been... It's been interesting reading that. But the one thing is she has it divided up by years, right? And so I was reading the year 1513. So much stuff happened. And I thought, I need to do a podcast, one of those like year in the life kind of things on 1513. So that's what we're doing today. So Henry is the king. And of course, in 1513, the queen is the formidable Catherine of Aragon, a Spanish princess with a stalwart spirit. Their union is yet to fray and become the seed of the religious revolution in England. In the church's high offices, a man named Cardinal Thomas Wolsey is steadily climbing the ranks. He is charismatic, political, and his influence is on the rise. 
leading him towards an eventual position as Lord Chancellor of England in just a couple more years. Across the channel, there's Ferdinand II of Aragon, Catherine's father, weaving his own intricate web of diplomacy unbeknownst to his English allies. In this single year, these figures and their stories intertwine in a remarkable tapestry of ambition, power, trust, and betrayal. This year, 1513, saw England flexing its muscles on the French battlefield, testing the mettle of its rulers, coping with personal tragedies, and planting the seeds for conflicts that would shape the course of history. It was a big year, you guys. So let's dive into the intricacies of this dramatic year. And remember, these are not just stories about kings and queens, but of people navigating through a tumultuous period of change, guided by their aspirations, fears, and beliefs. As 1513 dawned, England stood on the precipice of conflict. The nation's young, ambitious monarch, Henry VIII, was eager to prove his mettle on the battlefield and elevate his status among European rulers. Encouraged by his hawkish advisors and an appetite for glory, Henry declared war on France. The stage was set for what would become one of the defining military campaigns of his reign. But while Henry was preparing for war abroad, he was leaving behind a kingdom in need of governance. His choice for regent during his absence? His queen, Catherine of Aragon. This decision wasn't taken lightly. Entrusting the realm to Catherine was more than just an act of personal faith. It was a testament to her abilities and her competence. Catherine was a princess who had been tutored in politics and governance from a young age and was well prepared for the task. After all, she was the daughter of the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, the architects of modern Spain. Yet her regency was not without challenges. England was a realm known for its complex and, at times, unruly political landscape. The nobility could be fractious. Maintaining the kingdom's peace was a delicate balancing act. Further, with the king away, the threat of Scottish invasion became all too real, adding to the list of concerns that Catherine had to manage. Despite these challenges, Catherine rose to the occasion. She led with a combination of strength and astuteness, balancing the demands of governance while ensuring that the nation was prepared for any potential threats. As regent, Catherine showed herself to be more than just a queen consort. She was a capable ruler in her own right. However, Catherine's role wasn't just confined to the practical matters of ruling. She was also a crucial link between the home front and the battlefield. She served as a beacon of moral support for troops abroad and a source of steadfast leadership for the people at home. Meanwhile, as the queen steered the ship of state, Henry was setting sail for France, oblivious to the challenges that his wife would face and unaware of the chain of events his quest for glory would set in motion. Little did he know that while he sought victory on foreign soil, the groundwork for one of the most significant battles in English history was being laid at home. As we shall see, the year 1513 was not just about military campaigns and diplomatic maneuvers. It was a test of leadership, both on the battlefield and within the castle walls. It challenged preconceived notions of power and revealed the mettle of those who held it. In the absence of her husband, Queen Catherine had assumed the mantle of leadership. And while Henry VIII was seeking military glory, a threat emerged closer to home. James IV of Scotland, seizing the opportunity presented by Henry's absence, launched an invasion into northern England. Catherine was faced with her first significant test as regent. The queen, however, was no mere figurehead. Catherine was a woman of both intelligence and resolve, educated in the art of governance by her mother, Isabella of Castile. She understood that at stake was not just a piece of land in the north of England, but the very safety and stability of her realm. She acted decisively, rallying her forces and mobilizing the nobility and organizing the necessary provisions and armaments. Catherine's leadership was inspiring. She led from the front, even donning armor and addressing her troops, instilling in them a sense of courage and determination. And by the way, she was pregnant when she was doing this. She was several months pregnant. When I was several months pregnant, I did not want to put on armor and go into battle. Heading up in the morning felt like going into battle. <laughs> so yeah, I have mad respect for Catherine. 
Anyway, the ensuing battle, known as the Battle of Flodden Field, was bloody and brutal. But under the command of the Earl of Surrey, the English forces stood firm, drawing upon their discipline, their superior weaponry, and the strategic high ground that they held. The Scots, led personally by James IV, were resolute but ultimately met a devastating defeat. The Scottish king himself fell in battle, marking an end of an era in Scotland, destabilizing the realm for a generation, and he was actually the last king in the British Isles to die in battle. In the aftermath of the battle, Catherine was tasked with the grim duty of informing her husband about the victory. She sent Henry a letter, along with the bloodied coat of the fallen Scottish king, a visceral token of the price of their victory. Yet this triumph was not without its shadows. The cost in human lives was significant, and the victory highlighted the stark reality of war. It was a sobering moment for Catherine, a woman who valued peace but had led her nation to war. Yet she stood firm, maintaining control over the realm while proving herself a capable and decisive leader. And all this time, another figure was gaining prominence, a man who would become one of the most influential figures in the English court. This man was none other than Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, a figure who would soon become indispensable to the king. But as Wolsey's star was rising, the first strains were starting to show in the royal marriage. The war, the battle, the pressures of leadership, they began to create some cracks in what had once seemed an unshakable partnership. Catherine had proved herself as regent, but the challenges that she faced were just beginning. While England was embroiled in warfare and political maneuvering, a personal tragedy unfolded within the royal family. Catherine, who had already had several pregnancy losses, plus a son who had lived for just under two months, had been pregnant once again before Henry went to France. And everything looked like it was going really well this time. Hope swelled at the prospect of a male heir, someone to secure the Tudor lineage. But this was not to be. On September 17, 1513, Catherine gave birth to a son. The Venetian calendar of state papers records that a male heir was born to the King of England and will inherit the crown, the other son having died. It is possible that the child was born alive and died shortly afterwards. Also, it should be noted that Henry was still in France at this time. He wasn't due to return to England until the end of October. And it's highly unlikely that Henry would have been away for the birth of his son, which he had waited for for so long. So this gives credence to the fact that she had probably gone into labor too early and the baby who may have been born alive, like I said, did not live. This, of course, was a deeply personal loss, also another political setback, adding to the pressures the queen faced as she navigated the demands of her regency. She was still regent then when that was going on, too. So, yeah, not an easy time for Catherine. So, like I said as well, during this time, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, a man of humble origins, was consolidating his power and influence. Wolsey was not of noble birth. He was the son of a butcher in Ipswich, but his intellect and political acumen had caught the attention of the young King Henry. He had also served Henry VII in some minor roles. But while Henry VIII was away on his military campaigns, Wolsey's influence and power grew, creating an indelible impact on the English court and its politics. Wolsey's rise was a reflection of the changing dynamics of power in Tudor England. No longer was the nobility the sole gatekeeper of influence. A man of common birth, armed with education, cunning, and the favor of the king, could ascend to the highest ranks of power. But Wolsey's ascent was not without implications. His increasing influence began to create an imbalance in the court, a shift that would have far-reaching effects in the years to come. His ideas, particularly his conciliatory approach towards France, were often in stark contrast to the warlike ambitions of his king. In the midst of these sweeping changes, Catherine and Henry's relationship began to face its first tests. Catherine's miscarriage, Henry's ambition and need for a male heir, the strains of war, and the shifting dynamics in the court all served to create tension within their marriage. 
But then, in the midst of all of this public and personal drama, there was a political betrayal brewing, a betrayal that would come from a surprising source and would send shockwaves through the English court, altering the course of events in ways that Henry and Catherine could hardly have anticipated. In the grand chessboard of European politics, alliances shifted like sand. But there were some loyalties, some bonds that were supposed to be unshakable. Among these was the bond between England and Spain, solidified not only by their shared political interests against France, but also by the marriage of Henry and Catherine. Yet, 1513 would challenge this assumption. While Henry was focused on his military campaigns in France, this betrayal was brewing. The source of this betrayal was none other than Ferdinand of Aragon, Catherine's own father. To understand the magnitude of this betrayal, we must remember the strategic importance of the English-Spanish alliance. This was a bulwark against the power of France. It was supposed to be a joint front, a testament to the shared ambitions and mutual trust between the two nations. But Ferdinand had other plans. Seeing an opportunity to advance his interests, he negotiated a separate peace treaty with France, effectively leaving England isolated on the battlefield. This move wasn't just a political maneuver, it was a personal betrayal that severed trust between the two kingdoms. This act sent shockwaves through the English court. It was a personal affront to Henry and Catherine, and it laid bare the harsh realities of power politics where familial ties could be sacrificed at the altar of national interest. For Catherine, who had just finished up a successful term as regent, this betrayal was a bitter pill to swallow. It placed her in an incredibly challenging position, torn between the country of her birth and the country that she was ruling. The personal and political implications of her father's actions were profound and would come to shape her relationship with Henry and her role within the English court. Henry, on the other hand, felt the sting of betrayal and the taste of diplomatic defeat. His ambitions in France had not only failed to achieve its intended glory, he captured two small towns that year, but definitely did not have the huge military victory that he had expected. He was not crowned King of France the way he had wanted to be. So it was not a successful time, although when he left, he had expected that he would be coming back the next year to continue the war with the help of Spain. And then, of course, the betrayal kind of put an end to those thoughts. His ambitious campaign in France had not only failed to achieve its intended glory, but also had left him isolated and outmaneuvered on the diplomatic front. And then you've got Cardinal Woolsey advocating for a more dovish approach to France, which was in stark contrast to Henry's hawkish approach, and that gained some newfound relevance in the light of Ferdinand's betrayal. The impact on the relationship between Henry and Catherine was immediate. Catherine was left, like I said, in an extremely delicate position, torn between her duty to her husband and her loyalty to her father. This tension became a source of strain between Henry and Catherine, sparking the first cracks in what was once considered an unshakable union. Henry started to doubt Catherine, doubt whether he could trust her, suspect that maybe she had been in on it from the very beginning, and he started to distance himself from his queen. He began to question her loyalty. And the suspicion, though unfounded, became a rift that would only widen with time. It wasn't a permanent rift. Of course, they, the great matter wouldn't start for another decade. But it was some early signs that things were not all wonderful. And then you add to that Catherine's inability to provide Henry with a male heir. This became a much more pronounced issue. The loss of their son earlier that year now became a political problem, and it was a failure that was unfairly laid at Catherine's feet, adding to the strain on their relationship. Then you've got Cardinal Woolsey, his stars on the rise, finding himself in an increasingly influential position, advocating for a conciliatory approach towards France, which was once a source of contention with the king, but now suddenly seems like a pragmatic strategy in the face of England's isolation. This shift did not go unnoticed by the royal couple. As Woolsey's influence grew, so did the sense of uncertainty and instability within the court. The stage was set for a power struggle that would further deepen the cracks within the royal marriage. As 1513 drew to a close, the fallout from the events of this pivotal year were becoming clear. It had been a year of war and diplomacy, power and betrayal, love and loss. The decisions made and the actions taken during this year had far-reaching consequences, reshaping the course of English history. But perhaps most importantly, it marked the beginning 
very early, early, early beginning of the end of one of history's most famous royal couples. The events of this year laid the foundations for a tumultuous era marked by religious upheaval and political intrigue and royal drama. The fallout from 1513 would echo through the years, casting long shadows on the reigns of Henry and Catherine, setting into motion events that would culminate in England's break with the Catholic Church and the end of the royal marriage. So we will leave it there for right now. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, you can hop into the Tudor Learning Circle at tutorlearningcircle.com. It is a social network just for Tudor nerds to discuss this and all things related to Tudor history. And remember to grab your TudorCon online tickets at englandcast.com slash TudorCon online. I hope you enjoyed this delve into 1513. And I'm probably going to be doing a couple more of these um, because reading this book, having it divided up by years has uh, kind of shown me some things with a different perspective than I had before. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. And I will be back in a couple of weeks. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Blown on the wind, a sandal may be sweating. Blown on the wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoort a bird in bower a brick, that soul is samnies on sleek. Men's full maiden of me, fair and fresh as bonnie.